Good afternoon, everybody. We are here at Microsoft Reactor in Stockholm. Thank you very much to Erika Sentmartoni, who's working the AV booth in the back for hosting us today. I am joined by three wonderful panelists here in Stockholm. Rebecca Riedahl from InVenture, Eric Emmett King from J12, and Nora Baby. I may be, I might be obscuring her right now, from Unconventional Ventures. Um, welcome to a sold out event here in Stockholm. I paid my kids $50 to make sure that all the spots were taken. My son's in the back, so <laughs> he'll get his money at the end of the event. Um, we've all been to boring panels before. I can guarantee you this will not be a boring panel. Why will it not be a boring panel? Because I want everybody to learn at least one thing. I would like people to um, um, take notes. I would like people to um, find out what they missed and go back to the webcast in order to find out what they what they uh, didn't catch. And the most important thing to having a good panel is to invite the right people. And I think I've done that today. The second most important thing is to have a former New York radio DJ as your moderator, and I'm happy to do that. And um, I'll be asking rapid fire questions, no round robins, no going down the line with everybody making boring responses to the same question. If something's in your sweet spot, please jump in. Um, if something is going to get you fired, please don't answer the question. And um, just say pass or kick it over to some, somebody else. I'd like to keep the panelists on their toes and sweat a little bit and maybe even have a little bit of controversy. Um, we'll, know if, we'll know if we're learning something, if people are not doom scrolling on their phones, and if people are taking notes and referring to the, um, to the, the uh, podcast at the end. Um, the format will be 45 minutes of live questions. I see you guys are already having fun <laughs> behind my back. Um, you'll find out. Uh, 45 minutes of live questions, 15 minutes of Q&A, and mingling at the end. So we'll kick it off with introductions. I'm Alfredo Jolan. I run the Stockholm Techstars Accelerator. Techstars is a um, 13 in-person 13-week accelerator that's held biannually here in Stockholm. We'll kick it off in September for the first time. Uh, if you don't know Techstars, we're the world's largest early stage venture investor. We manage $957 million. Uh, dollars. We have a huge network. Our CRM has 689,000 names in it. For context, if you take all of Sweden, every 15th person is in our CRM. We will This year, we'll invest over $100 million in 630 early stage startups. We run 56 programs. Uh, we just added Lagos, Nigeria in 38 locations in 18 countries. It's highly competitive to get in. We have 30,000 applications for 650 spots. That's a 2.2% admit rate. Just by reference, uh, Harvard admitted 3.2% of its applicants this year. So it's harder to get into Techstars than to get into Harvard. For the Europeans here, Oxford admits 15% of its applicants. Um, lifetime, we have funded 3,000 companies in 300 accelerators. That means 7,000 founders. We've had 1,000 exits and 19 unicorns. And we maintain a network of 7,700 active mentors and 20,000 investors of which these three distinguished panelists are um, among them. So I would like to kick it over to Nora, Emmett, and Rebecca to introduce yourself, your firm, and your role at the firm. And then we'll jump right into some questions. All right, thanks for, for having me here. I'm Emmett King, one of the founding partners of J12 Ventures. Um, briefly, my background, originally from the UK, close to 10 years now in Sweden, um, co-founded a consumer fintech company some years ago, which is now listed. And I've been doing early stage investments for about eight years, um, first through an angel fund structure and now uh, through J12, um, where we're positioned as a pre-seed and seed stage investor, mostly based in Sweden, team of founders and operators um, yeah, investing in companies as early as, you know, a few people with a market that they, that they want to go after and just registered the company up to you know one to two years of traction and momentum still finding that repeatability and predictability of growth to to, to continue to expand um more and more investing across the wider nordics also in germany and the uk um pretty agnostic in in the sectors that we that we invest in we do both b2b b2c marketplaces SaaS models transaction business models kind of the full spectrum that's the short. Cool. And I'm Rebecca uh, Ryder. I've been in venture as well for now about seven years. Uh, ended up in venture a little bit by accident, but loved it so much. So I got stuck, uh, especially early stage investing, which I do today at InVenture. Uh, 
InVenture, I guess we're a journalist fund and I'm a journalist at heart. Uh, love looking at all sorts of things. Uh, although I have been doing mostly SaaS and software, to be honest, in my past couple of investments. Um, but yeah, I have been at two funds before joining, have been CFO and CEO way many years ago as a little bit of an operations background as well. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I love doing the early stage investing. I think it's the most fun. It's the most complex where everything is very uncertain. It's very chaotic still. And I think you can also make more of a difference as an investor. So I wanted to join a fund where they are generally sort of hands-on and want to be helpful and have operational support in-house as well to really, really be able to support uh, early stage founders and make a difference. Um, so that's why I decided to join InVenture. It's only like two months ago now, so still fairly new on the job. But yeah, glad to be here. Thanks so much for having us. You're welcome. And Nora, how about you? Well, I'm called the accidental general partner, so that's part of my story, but I'm actually a brand strategist at heart, been working with the IT and telecoms industry before it became the sexy tech industry, uh, helping Nordic companies entering international markets and helping Nor uh, international companies entering the Nordics. Became later a tech founder, tried to build the Spotify of education, but actually um, realized that it wasn't ethical for me to do that because of the incredible gaps that exist in the industry. So I became the investor that I needed, that I never met in the Nordics. And I realized that the funding gaps and the inequalities in the industry is actually a huge opportunity for those that can see it, seek it, find it, and reach it. And that's what we do. So today I am a, a founding partner of Unconventional Ventures. We invest in early stage companies founded by diverse founders, meaning from et ethnic, gender, uh, sexual orientation perspective uh, into impact companies. So you have to have uh, one or the, uh, two of the 17 sustainability goals in your business model because we truly believe that the future that we want to be part of is both equal and sustainable. And you can't have one or the other without the other. Nora, let's kick it off by, I thank you everybody for your introductions. Let's kick it off by talking about diversity, DEI. Um, what does diversity mean to you? Well, obviously diversity means incredibly amount of perspectives. Um, but I think uh, on top of that, that also means access. That all of the people that want to, whether no matter who they are or or what they have, can actually access um, anything in this society. Access to capital, access to ideas, access, access to, access capital, to relationships. relationships, talent, um, so on and so forth. Do you think there's enough access in a country like Sweden? We're incredibly behind. We have been forefronters when it comes to gender diversity, but in, not in even in the gender diversity aspect are we doing well. And I think we need to burst the bubble um, to make sure that we're actually getting the innovation we so desperately need because we're at a point now that we've been scaling at all costs. Now we need to mend at all costs. Rebecca, this is a topic that's near and dear to your heart. Prepare yourself for this question. Why do Swedish venture firms typically have only one female partner? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it's still a fairly conservative business, and um, a lot of the founding partners are, you know, are still a little bit, I think, conservative and not um, maybe open to to diversity in the sense that well, probably not early enough either. So they haven't hired enough uh, female like investment managers on time. That's getting better. Like the layer below is looking a lot better. So hopefully over time it will be adjusted. But I think it happened fairly late. When I started an adventure uh, like seven years ago, it was still very few uh, investment managers that were female. So that's, uh, you know, means the sourcing for partners is smaller. Um, Can we ask a male founding partner on the stage if he has specific diversity criteria within his fund? Um, within internally or yeah. in how we invest? Both, both. Um, so not specific criteria that, that we that we aim for there. I think we we focus a lot on kind of equal opportunity in the things that we do, our recruitment processes, as well as in the way that we source opportunities to invest in, and the way that we work with the the founders that we invest in as well to to you know increase inclusion and diversity in their teams as well. Um, over time, we definitely look to move towards kind of equal representation across different perspectives of diversity within our team and particularly the investment team, because I think 
uh, representation kind of reflects the opportunity that you can give as well. Um, but you know, our our starting point is uh, is, is multiple male founders, so so we're we're not there yet. Can we focus on the basics and maybe some rapid fire answers? We heard at the beginning the stages at which you participate. Maybe you can each take off the the ticket sizes that you that you write um, from left to right. Rebecca through Nora. Yeah, sure. So we typically do one to three million euros, uh, but we can also now do earlier tickets. We have something called a talent pocket uh, that's still not really official yet. So you get, uh, but we can do smaller tickets when it's really strong sort of founders that know what they're doing because we can't maybe spend as much time. Um, but yes, yeah, so anything from like three hundred thousand to three. Uh, million euros and I think in about 70% of the cases we are the first uh, investor on board if you look at our portfolio today so don't mind being the first so Rebecca is one to three million as low as 300 often the first investor how about you Emmett and we're about from as little as one to 200,000 euros up to about two million euros right. also usually the first capital in or at least uh, institutional capital how about you Nora well, I'm happy to share that we will be investing 100 um, and even go lower because we know that even at early stages, earlier than needing that ticket of 100 uh, is sometimes uh, very crucial. So we're open for smaller tickets depending on um, what stage and obviously what industry, but we can go up, up till 1 million euros. So we have a good range of early seed uh, tickets on the dais. Do, um, again, maybe from... Nora to Rebecca, do you have any verticals that you specialize in? I mean, we're, we're very industry agnostic. I think most all of three or more or less are, but obviously we have a soft spot for health tech, femtech, ed tech, um, positive fintech. So it has to have a positive impact. Uh, no more credits, thank you. <laughs> uh, and then obviously food tech um, is, is a, a space we're seeing increasing climate sustainability tech. And also a new space that we're calling diversity tech. And the reason why we call it diversity tech is actually about how do we monitor on data that is actually impacting uh, from an HR perspective to healthcare perspective, which we kind of define as diversity tech. It seems like everybody's vertical agnostic. Emmett and, and Rebecca, would you like to add any any specialties no. to the mix? No, we're very much a generalist fund. Okay. We do, uh, can do pretty much anything. Uh, we don't do too much like drug discovery or on the very <laughs> deep sort of life science side. No but most things in you. tech, everything from like deep tech to consumer. Uh, Rebecca, when you meet with founders, what are you most hoping to hear from them? What's an ideal pitch to you? I, I love founders that have unique and deep insight into the problem they're trying to solve. So you can tell that they really spend a lot of time understanding the customers they want to target and the problem they want to solve. So that genuine like knowledge into what they're trying to solve is something I always look for. And then that uh, passion and eagerness to build something really, really big. Uh, that big vision and that conviction and drive to continue building something big. Uh, that's, yeah, those are some of the most important. And then, of course, like uh, that they are able to attract stellar team to them and, and hire people that are even maybe better than themselves. Um, that's something I love as well. Um, yeah. Emmett, when a founder says this to you, you know you won't invest. If, I can answer that as well. I mean, we have no competitors. That, that's 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 definitely one. Um, Please sign my NDA. That's also one. Okay. Uh, the two softballs for you. Yeah. Um, no, I think those definitely um, something cap table related. If uh, if if some somebody's left a big chunk on the cap table, Russians on the cap table. Um, that would be something to understand. <laughs> You're very different. This is this is being live streamed all the way to Russia. I'm sure we IP blocked. So I'll I'll let you uh, wiggle out of that one. Nora, what is the most important question founders rarely ask you? What what can you bring to the table besides capital? I think that's one of the biggest questions that I try to teach founders to do more of. Uh, don't worry just about the you know ticket sizes investors can come in with. Ask them what they can bring to the table, or if not them, their team, their group, who do they have inside, right? Um, but I think just a quick reflection, I mean, 
um, we have to also understand that there are, I mean, the, the funding gap is a, is a reflection of the salary gap, which is a reflection of the, the impossible barriers that some talent are facing, right? So sometimes when we look at founders, um, I don't care how much you worked on at what kind of title you have had previous. I want to know why this problem is of interest of you and if you experience that problem yourself. I think that's the most important thing for me. And then when you understand that, you also have to understand that the talent pool that you're attracting might not look the same for others. So I evaluate what kind of different talent pool are you able to attract. Um, because when we look into that, that kind of tells us as well as that you're smart enough to understand that you're not looking at the same spaces as others. And that interests me much. That's a great point and a great answer. Rebecca, how important are metrics to you and how much traction do you typically look for in a startup? So I think at seed stage, um, it's sometimes a little bit uh, hard to look too much on traction. Um, we want to understand that there's market potential and that you've sort of defined who you want to go for and that that group of customers is big enough so this can become really, really big. That's important. I think you can almost fool yourself if you're looking too hard at like early stage uh, metrics because it's just too early to extrapolate. So, um. Emmett, I want to throw this by, by you. I've spoken to a f more than a few founders recently who say, um, I am going to raise 50 million sec. I have no product. I have no co-founder. Um, I have no customers, but I had a meeting with J12 and I think they're going to fund me next week. How do you uh, respond to that kind of anecdotal? Extremely generous, yeah. <laughs> I'm putting you in the hot seat, but I, I haven't had that conversation more than okay. once recently. We must give very positive indications. <laughs> um, Everybody loves you. Yeah. Um, no, we tend not to do uh, too much of that. I think. Um, but does it indicate some kind of founder psychosis about? Uh... I think. I, I mean, I th I do think that there's there are you know f for a lot of founders, it's the first time that they raise capital, yeah. especially at this stage, and so I think there can be an immaturity and an inexperience around what that process looks like. Um, if you've never gone from a first meeting to a second meeting with a VC, you don't know how far away you are from you know, an investment committee decision and understanding you know when when the the term sheet's going to come so i think it 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 does happen that those doing it for the first time think that they have somebody on the hook when actually from you know the investor perspective there's a long way to go to understand something and and, and want to do that so uh, to the questions that founders should ask i think very much what the process is you know, and to not only to you know as an information point but in order to be part of driving the process because you don't want to be passive to you know when the investor remembers that they should get back to you they're going to do that i mean you know make them you know take responsibility for moving the process forward and so that you mutually have a view on how things move forward otherwise you might think that the term sheet's around the corner but that really may not be the case um so i, I think there's there's definitely those that are doing it for the first time Nora, what can founders do to move the process forward with you? Well, I mean, right now I'm at a moment that it, where it's humanly impossible to keep up with all the incredible talent and deal flow that we do having. So I think in terms of communication, I'm very, you know, open communication. Uh, but I love when I get updates. I love when I get updates on conversations. Keep them going. The metrics, new customers, new signing, new things. Just keep it because I see it. It's just that I don't have enough band space to get back to you. But keep me updated. I love that. Do you think, um, where do you think we are in the market cycle? Spotify broke $100 today. If you've been paying attention to Spotify, the all-time high in Spotify's stock price in New York was $365. It's now trading 23% below its IPO price of $132, which is four years ago. So you've lost money investing in Spotify over four years. Uh, this has wiped, um, wait for these numbers, $4.5 billion off of Daniel X fortune. And Spotify is down almost 72% from its high. So the funding environment will be affected if this continues. And where do you think we stand in this market cycle right now? Uh, Emmett's taking the mic back over. Um, I'm not asking you to predict the market. <laughs> okay, that's a pass. Do you think there will be knock-on effects to, to early stage investing anytime soon? 
I think it's, it's necess- or has it already begun? Necessarily, I think it will kind of trickle down. I mean, obviously, at pre-seed seed, we're the furthest away from the public market, so I think there is also more of a, a willingness to continue to operate because companies being invested in are, you know, you, you're betting on outcomes that rely on the market situation eight, ten years into the future. So I think that's one side to it. The other side is given that there is a price contraction at later stages trickling down series B, series A, necessarily you can't have seed valuations quite what they were last year because you want to still have the multiple uptick for what the valuation is going to be in in series A. So I think what we'll see is a little bit of a divergence more and more between the good companies that will continue to get funded and, and have, you know, high high valuations maintained and the rest where i think there'll be a lot of downward pressure on on pricing and less willingness to fund those companies a lot more um stringent looking on capital efficiency so not only growth as i think we've had for a few years being kind of in the spotlight but growth at what cost being much more um looked at and and if going into the very early you know parts of the market then i think definitely you know elements of the angel investor market will will be a lot less active than they've been before so while there's committed capital in institutions like ours that will continue to operate there are a lot of individual investors who will think twice and pause and and be a lot more selective or or look after the portfolio that they already have this is another factor that I don't know how it will play out and that's the fact that it's a record level amount of dry powder in VCs at the moment so so yes I, I think you're right like angels will probably not be as active and sort of the less professional ones at least and we will see you know valuations influencing seed rounds as well but at the same time like the, it's never happened that a VC fund has given back money to LPs or not used the commitments they have right can you explain what dry powder uh, is to the audience so that means that they have raised record uh, large funds um, that they need to invest within two to three years. Um, sure, we have seen um, deployment cycles, like how fast you actually invest the money become faster and faster. Maybe that will go back to more normal levels, like up to three years. But still, it will be invested. And uh, since we have record amounts, you know, that will affect the valuation still for the very best companies, at least. Um, Rebecca, yeah. I know. Go ahead, Nora. Yeah, yeah. So. Oh, record-breaking years. Don't get me started on record-breaking years. For who, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. I thought you might have a view, list, Nora. Yeah. Uh, so record-breaking views. So I think like this. And I heard, I think maybe it was your panel in, in Riga I heard this, uh, that we're in the sec- intersection of bubble and, and bloom. Um, I kind of. Uh, I often say that, but I don't think I said that, that on the stage. Uh, I, thought <laughs> I, saw, I heard someone. It was so smart. So, yes. It might have I been think, seed camp. Mm, Maybe no. we'll see. I don't, as you see, I don't remember everything. Um, I remember you can attribute smart things, smart things to me. I'll it doesn't happen very often. <laughs> well, I give this to you. Uh, but here's the thing. So I, I, I truly see that the crazy amount of valuations that we have had is going to decrease, right? It's going to cool down because it's needed to cool down. But what I'm also seeing, which is I'm happy about as an impact investor, uh, is that I also see that we're hopefully finally stop putting more money into things like more food suppliers, right? Uh, or uh, more food delivery suppliers, I might add, in in an industry that is, and, and in a society where we're throwing away 90% of the food that we're getting in. Uh, don't quote my 90%. Um, so I, I'm my fear is, is that this is going to impact the very founders that are already impacted. But my hope is that I know that many of the founders that we look at and the teams that we look at are actually targeting real problems, real solutions, and they need global solutions. So that's why I'm really excited for the pipeline that we're looking into. Um, but I, I am worried that the, you know, that the, that the investors that are seeing the record-breaking numbers are still, you know, sitting cool in the boat. Well, I, I would add that that the ticket sizes you talk about, $100,000, is a real meaningful difference to certain founders as opposed to a B round that goes from that contracts from 75 million to 50 million. But also I think in terms of angel investors, you know, angel investors cooling down, I, I'm happy that we are actually seeing more diverse 
uh, angel investors, meaning more women investing, more uh, founders or you know previous founders or and existing founders of color investing more and more as angel tickets. So I think those are actually becoming more accessible. But in terms of VC, I, I, I still have conversations with VC that we need to stop putting that much amount of, um, of uh, approval or validation that some founders have attracted angel investments because those are also not accessible for everyone. I hear a lot of backstory about, about the ecosystem in Sweden. How would um, maybe Emmett, how, would, how strong do you think the Swedish ecosystem is? Since you, you invest across Europe, can you maybe rank the Swedish ecosystem among the strongest ecosystems that you see in the EMEA region? Where would you rank it? I mean, we do most of our investing in Sweden, so I, I don't have equal knowledge in, in, in other hubs necessarily. I think, you know, if I would rank... You, you are British. I am British, so I, I will name London as a, as a relevant ecosystem. And I think Berlin, obviously, is the other big one, and, and there's, there's a lot happening there. Um, I think Sweden and Stockholm, as the biggest part of that, continues to be extremely strong as a result of you know a flywheel of successful companies and investors and founders and first employees that are that have come out of those companies of course but we see also that there are other ecosystems that are really you know have started to catch up a lot in the last few years you know, like in copenhagen in tallinn um oslo becomes stronger and stronger um so i think the rest of the nordics is is very much kind of maturing and, and getting closer to where to where stockholm has been S sweden stockholm still i think you know has challenges relating to cost of living housing you know these things that are important to talent um so those can be a hindrance to whether as a as an ecosystem can continue to develop or whether it kind of reach some kind of some kind of peak um and yeah i th I think we've seen i mean there's a lot more diversity within sweden as a society the last few years i think that one other thing that will prohibit you know stockholm and sweden from maintaining its position as a very strong e ecosystem is if you know inclusion of all of the talent and all of the people that have have kind of entered more and more into the society in the last few years if that isn't kind of you know successful and 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 you know done in a very good way then there's a real missed opportunity as well as you know uh, kind of an, an injustice there but i think that's an opportunity that sweden has uh, as opposed to some other nordic ecosystems that maybe don't have the opportunity to be so diverse in the next years um as another way to to kind of have an advantage you know from a resource perspective if you want to look at it that way but it's not there yet Rebecca, working for a Finnish firm, where do you rank the Swedish ecosystem within other European ecosystems? And secondarily, mm -hmm. do you characterize your relationship with VC colleagues in Stockholm and in, in Finland as more collaborative or, or competitive? So on the VC ecosystem, I think Stockholm is still fairly strong and probably the strongest in the Nordics. Um, my perspective but um, there's new ecosystems merging that I find really exciting such as Tallinn where you see like strong incentives so it's really easy to set up good incentive structures for for founders there and as you said also cheaper cost of living and other things um, but yeah I think there's still work to be done to to maintain Stockholm and improve Stockholm as the leading sort of uh, ecosystem there's still a lot of work to be done when it comes to collaboration I think it's still it's still fairly collaborative. I find it, even though it's definitely become more like there's more funds competing for the, for the same deals. I don't. I still don't find early stage VC investing super competitive. We share deals. You don't, you know, keep your deals secret too much, or believe that deal flow is too proprietary. If you're raising money, we know you're going to talk to everyone, right? You're not dumb or most of the funds anyway and then i, I still find it um, fairly inclusive and collaborative um and that's the way i want to play the game like play the long game and not uh, play the short game mm. Nora, do you do you want to take a crack at the some of the primary weaknesses of the swedish ecosystem emmett named a few housing and and say talent recruitment well i mean the cost of living hate to build the one <laughs> but as i mentioned if we're constantly looking at the same talent pool then obviously we're going to have a talent shortage but but i do 
agree that there is a couple of challenges that you mentioned or both of you have mentioned that um, the Swedish ecosystem is experiencing and so is the Nordics. But what I'm seeing is that, you know, the international capital, as an example, U.S. capital is moving in quite quickly and actually moving in on those incredible things that, you know, the Nordics are missing out on. And, and I don't know if that's good or bad at the end of the day. It depends on what 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 lens I'm looking at it. Uh, but I would say, I mean, I am here in the Nordics and doing the work, and I truly believe that we can lead the work in the Nordics um, because we also have another system. Obviously, we have the government system here that is a lot of gives a lot of support and muscles to the ecosystem, and that is obviously going to make a huge difference going forward. Now, I think the question is, what is going to happen with the state of the world right now and the position now EU wants to take on how to support the different ecosystems. Um, but I, I truly believe that, I mean, there's a reason why you are here. And I think that always, always tells the tale as well. Um, do, but you wanna, I, do you want to tell your Bradfield story? <laughs> yeah. So his book is behind me. I have yeah, I two, saw two it. Books. Venture Deals is one of the yeah. most famous books I you'll know. ever read. And Bradfield is the founder of Techstars. Yeah. Right? So for those of you that don't know, this is our CEO's book, Trampled by Unicorns. Yeah. And the person who asked the best question from the audience will get a copy of this. Good. Um, so when I started, um, so, well, here's the thing. So when I explored the VC world, right, and talked to so many investors, everyone kept saying to me, yeah, you should read this book. And it was The Venture Deals. Funny enough, my U.S. investor said to me, you need to talk to someone. Now that you're doing this, you need to talk to someone. I was like, okay, sure. And then she said, side this meeting, and then in comes Brad Feld. And I was like, I know I've seen his name somewhere. But anyway, so we started to talk. And he was talking about his experience and the books that he's written. And then I took a look at my shoulder and I see, OK, it's that book. OK, he was the author of that book. I'm literally talking to one of the most experienced people in this industry, but also the, the most impactful, because he's literally an under co-founder, obviously, a co-writer, have influenced this ecosystem immensely on a global scale. So I asked him the same way, great work, but what about the funding gap? <laughs> what do you say about the funding gap? And then he told me, he shares my, my uh, concerns. He thinks that um, you know, the, the things and the foundation that we were setting with unconventional ventures could be great, but he didn't know about the Nordics because you work more on a global scale. Nordics is still fairly new to you. And then I said, when is Techstar coming to Stockholm? He's like, no, but we're talking about it. And then I told him that, okay, well, while you're talking about it, I'm going to launch an accelerator for diverse founders building impact tech. And that's what happened. And then happened. you got scared. <laughs> <laughs> and then you came the year after. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, so that was the funny story that Brad Feld was actually one of the first people I get, got to talk to uh, entering this space. Almost everybody has a positive Brad Feld story. At the, the firm I was a CFO at before, um, this, the CEO cold emailed Brad Feld four years ago and just, just had a running conversation with him over email, helping him with his business. Super. So I kept him updated, so you know, and he always responds. Okay. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things to talk about being a portfolio manager myself is uh, the companies in your portfolio and your anti-portfolio. So I wonder if, if you might share with me uh, and a live streamed audience uh, one company that you regret having passed on and why. You were given these questions in advance, so. <laughs> um, well, I'll share one, because um, it is an interesting exercise to keep track on, and I think it's Bessemer, maybe, that has the best yeah. example of it. Um, um, so, I mean, we said no to a company a couple of years ago called Juni, Uni. Um, uh, they've done very well since then. Very well. Who knows how well they would have done if we'd said yes. <laughs> um, but so that was the seed round there. Um, and they've gone on and raised, I think, about $70 million uh, in, the, in the next two years. So, so it is sometimes. Rebecca, will you buy it or no? Um, You're still thinking. We did have a chance at my previous fund to invest in Einride uh, fairly early and said no. And I think that was, yeah. That's a pretty big mess. Yeah. Well, we'll see. Like, there's still not an exit there, but, uh, you know, I would have liked to. And I really like the founders there a lot. So I think that was, that's in my anti portfolio for sure. And would you care, Nora, would you care to 
add or or talk about one or two companies in your uh, not in your portfolio that you really respect and why? Sure. I mean, we had we uh, launched the accelerator last year, um, equity free, free of everything, and and we didn't have. Um, so we weren't able to invest in the very companies and founders that we met for the first time. So I've literally been watching for a year now founders that just sent a simple spreadsheet and a simple deck, literally like not even four pages, two pages, um, where I said, hell yes. And then they now close pre-seed and raising seed this year. And I'm seeing VCs jumping all over them. And I'm like, what? Ah. Um, but I'm very happy about that. I'm very proud of them. Of course, Leia is one of those femtech companies that now is raising seed. Um, another company is actually UK-based, a climate tech company. I love them called Climate X. Um, they they are building one of the most important software that we literally need needed yesterday. Um, they closed their pre-seed and they're raising their oh they closed their seed even now raising Series A this fall, doing incredibly well. Um, so those are just on top of my head too. Would anybody like to uh, take a crack at the most overhyped or overrated startup in the Nordics or Baltics, or will this get people fired? I can do that, but um... I said I would go first. I think Gorillas in Berlin. Which one? Gorillas in Berlin. Gorillas. I saw Cosmo.com and WebM fail in the U.S. I lived above a grocery store in Brooklyn. I couldn't get groceries delivered in 15 minutes in Brooklyn. Living above a grocery store. I have no idea how they're going to get groceries delivered across Europe in 15 minutes. And I know this is being webcast. And they've raised a lot of money. And I could get fired. But you have to be honest. You have to be honest, right? Yeah. So, I mean, some of the food service suppliers we've seen blooming. Um, that worries me. <laughs> so there seems to be a theme here. Yeah, it really seems to be a theme. But I see it from a, from an other perspective because the labor that is being used today is not ethical. And that scares the shit out of me that we are seeing this. We're witnessing it, but we're not saying anything. And we are actually accepting it as consumers. I did a clubhouse call where uh, the founder of a of a diverse startup said yes when i arrived in stockholm uh for my graduate program he's from south asia um uh, i did the first thing a south asian founder does in stockholm i delivered food so um does anybody else wish to take a crack at that or you're gonna pass <laughs> i'll pass i meant to pass he's also gonna pass okay well nora and i are the brave ones yeah right <laughs> speak your values right nora yeah. Um, um, I, I have a lot more questions. I think, I think I sent you about 50. Yeah. And you know, I'm always open to answer everything, but I don't think there's enough time. Today. I don't think so. Maybe we can turn to some questions from the audience and the best question from the audience gets a copy of Miles book. How are we on time, Erica? Good. Online questions are great. So. I know Swedish audience people are reluctant to raise their hands. There was one. Great. I love that. Okay, and I can I can repeat the question if it's if it can't be heard. I will repeat it for the webcast. And can you please state your name and your affiliation? Sure. Uh, well, I'm Manuel. I'm the founder of Posse and Dr. Community Innovation. And I'm one of those experienced founders raising capital. So I would like to know or if you could elaborate a little bit more on the process of uh, since uh, getting funded so for the web webcast manuel from cose would like to uh, have a better understanding of the investment process from first contact to to term sheet and emma touched on this earlier because many founders think the first contact is equivalent to a term sheet which it obviously is not it has been known to be on occasion but we'll skip that but, <laughs> um to generalize i guess because it, it always you know can differ i think most funds will look to have the first meeting if there isn't a partner in that meeting i.e a decision maker someone that, that can kind of really sponsor that deal internally then the next step will be to bring a partner into the process and then I think, you know, it's dependent on the fund how many meetings they're going to want to have with you know, one or two or three members of their team to really understand what you're doing and dig into the different areas of the business. Um, 
often that process and the material that is requested. So I think that's another signal for how interested the fund is, is what material they're asking for, how engaged they are in the meetings that you have. If it's very much you talking to them, then they're probably less informed about what you're doing and less interested in what you're doing than if you're having very collaborative kind of co-working sessions essentially i think then you know that they're engaged and they're interested they also want to sell their value to you as well but a few meetings to understand uh, the business um, probably introduce you to the rest of the partner decision making team and then most funds have an investment committee uh, meeting internally where the decision makers will will vote essentially on if they want to put forward a term sheet so that's kind of one clear point in the process that, that you should have an indication if you're moving towards that decision point or not. Rebecca, would you like to address the the topic that I often hear of from founders called ghosting? Hmm. What does ghosting mean to you? Because obviously it means something different to founders. No, so I think what you should remember is that VCs look at a lot of cases, just like Nora was saying as well, we get over like overwhelmed sometimes with, I think so far we have a thousand cases just registered this year in our CRM. That's a lot. And we meet a lot of them as well. So sometimes it's just, I think by, you know, us being super busy and forgetting to, to return to our founder, but it's sloppy. We try to be fast when we respond and we try to be fast when saying no, because ghosting is dragging out too long in the process and not being sure. And that's when you as a founder should ask, you know, where are we in the process? What's the next step to move forward? And when are we aiming to, you know, get to a decision here? So that's, uh, and just one thing to add on if you're new to VC, I don't believe in warm intros. A lot of people talk about warm intros, that it matters, but I don't think, especially in Sweden, that it matters that much. I try to respond to everyone, even though, of course, we do have always very, very full inboxes. So I think it's important um, to be fine with cold uh, emailing and, and look at a case, even though it comes directly to me and not through someone I already know, because otherwise you miss great opportunities, I think. Um, but also use all the free resources out there. There's so many good like pitch deck. You have one pitch deck guide. We have one pitch deck guide. And there's so many free guides out there, like how to pitch your company. Um, so use those. Mm. Nora, do you feel that um, a firm no is a better asset to a founder or keeping somebody in a holding pattern? How do you prefer to deal with people? Leave the, the call option open or say no and, and thank you, but no thanks. I mean, um, because we look at very early stages, we never have a firm no. Um, we always have follow-ups for that reason, but we're in a very spe specific spot as well because we've been fundraising ourselves as well. So that's kind of... You know what it feels like to be told no. Oh, God, yes. <laughs> uh, but I have to say, I give it to you, fundraising as a fund manager versus as, as a founder is a thousand times harder. So I just want to put it out there. Mad respect for those that are raising funds in VC. Uh, but um, but what we do is that we connect. We never leave a founder out like that. I, I mean, we connect. What do you need? Who do you need? Uh, if we can't come, you know, come in with capital, then who do we have? And we have an incredible network. Um, so that's kind of what we always do. That is very tech stars, by the way. You see? How can we help? <laughs> exactly. How can we help? And just one more thing to say about this. We... Uh, we do say no a lot and we also get it wrong a lot. <laughs> so, I mean, I try to keep that in mind. Like what we do is complex and it's delayed gratification. We don't actually know if we're right or wrong until like five or 10 years down the line. So, and we're very aware of that. Um, we talk about anti-portfolios. Yeah. I worked at a fund in New York that passed on Amazon as an investment. <laughs> and that's that's bound to happen <laughs> ever, every investor, right? Yes. That we get it wrong. So it doesn't mean it's the end of the world. <laughs> Next question from the audience. Yeah. Please let them read more than one. Yes. Yeah. Could you state your name, please? And um, uh, Seto. I work as a Apple developer, uh, Apple platform developer. Um, don't have startup yes. per se, but I have <laughs> a side project. Uh, I have a specific question for Emmet. I um, met one of the founders of one of your portfolio companies recently on a ski trip and 
we talk about another block io could you tell more about it how how did the pitching or i don't know how 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 did they end up uh, getting your check and uh, secondly what's your take for all the panelists on the web3 movement and the startup doing web3 so the, also, i i will um give the mic a chance to travel forward again and yeah um, i have a last question <laughs> oh i'm sorry you have a third question uh what's the role of the working prototype for your decision making process okay Is it, like really important so I think the the question was Mike. So I don't think I need to repeat it. Yeah. So firstly, specifically on another block, this comment how we, how we looked at that. Um, so another block is briefly they're a platform for music NFTs. So they um, you know go out after top top tier content. So that's like the weekend Beyonce, Swedish House Mafia songs, um, and the rights holders of those songs. And those rights holders are due royalties to those songs and take a certain portion of those rights tokenize them and sell them as nfts on their platform so they do drops of those um, so that retail investors can buy them or fans can buy them so it it opens up the huge music asset class to retail investors and it enables fans to connect with and own the music that they love as well um so we met that team during last summer and and that's an example of a company that we basically invested in at the point of them starting the company and registering a bollocks circuit so it's uh it's a team that we really liked it's a space that we that we see a lot of potential in and a great use case um for web3 and for nfts um and so it's kind of the the example of a pre-seed investment that, that we wanted to to take a very early bet on for us to then segue into the second question view on web3 we we see a lot of that it's become a huge proportion of our deal flow is is anything kind of web3 related where we've been most interested and what's guided that investment in another block which is our first investment in the space is kind of real underlying asset value connected to the nfts and real use in in using that technology for the use case so as opposed to some projects and use cases that we see that are very much driven on speculation or on scarcity i think what we like to see is real asset value or real utility value um in what's been driven but i think it's it's a space where people are figuring out what might work what won't there'll be a lot of wrong bets but a few that pay off will be highly valuable so, so people are willing to place more than less Rebecca or Nora, would you be willing to to also answer that question in terms of this schematic? Web3 NFTs are X percent hype and X percent reality. Would you be willing to say, throw a number out there, 80, 20, 50, 50, 90, 10? 70, 30, 70% hype and 30% uh... Uh, but we are, I mean, it's getting better. I think we're seeing more and more useful applications of NFTs. Um, and it's easy to discard it if you think it's just a hype, and it's not. I mean, we see 100 million people building within the Web3 now. And if you compare it to how the early days of the internet looked, it looks very similar. So we can't, like, ignore it and just say, no, nah, it's just a hype. Uh, I think that would be... Do you have a view, or is this outside of your wheelhouse? <laughs> My department from the beginning, uh, but uh, focusing on other things. So I would say, as an investor, we we don't have the mandate to invest in those kind of products or companies at the moment. But on a private note, I truly believe Web three is not a hype. I hundred percent believe in it. Uh, but obviously, there's a huge maturity that needs to happen. So I think um, for everyone or anyone that does anything, you know, learn, uh, be involved, see what it's where it's, what it's going and what's going to happen, uh, but don't uh, you know um, think that it is that it's just a hype because then you're missing out. Um, yeah, and then the other side from an ethical perspective as well is that I see the people that are, had always had access has even more access into Web3 NFTs. And that kind of worries me because now we're literally creating a new type of colonialism, digital colonialism. 
Now I said that. I think it's a topic that's often not fully addressed, and I agree with you. Next question from the audience. I can play microphone so passer. Hi, guys. <clears throat> My name is Nerenga. I'm a CEO and co-founder of Fashion Tech Capsulated. And I just recently onboarded a co-founder who is a crucial, who brings crucial competence to my business. Congratulations. However, all the pitches I have ever seen, there's also always one primary founder that kind of carries that flag. So I'm wondering, does, does it strengthen my case to bring a co-founder to the pitching? And if so, um, how do you usually uh, experience those pitches where there's a co-founder or co-founders um, and what should be the areas that we should be covering as opposed to just one founder carrying the entire presentation. Thank you. We'll take this. Well, congratulations on making that decision. I know it's not easy going from a sole founder to a co-founder, uh, but it's also like marriage, right? You never figure out the divorce and it's it's incredibly hard. And I think that's the, the, the role that you need to have. It's about communication, right? And, and, and you have to strengthen the communication between you and that kind of reinforces the case when you speak to investors. So I think what the strategy here would be um, go to the basics. What expertise do you different? You know, um, do you each have, and then you emphasize on those things in the deck. So that's a way. And obviously, one of you have to take the lead. And maybe depending on the investor, but because I hope you kind of do your, you know, uh, and yeah, due diligence on the investors. Depending on investors, that is going to tell you what kind of expertise that investor do you have and then you take you let whoever of you had the best best expertise that compares with his or hers um to do the conversation but maybe we have i bet you have something to say yeah no i, I would just to build on, on what you said i think and maybe it's a taste thing i think for first meetings i always believe it's a lot stronger if one founder takes those meetings and i think that's partly because you're trying to build a relationship and i think it's easier to build a re relationship one on one than two and one because a triangle is harder to kind of balance than than to create a rapport one on one and the f the purpose of a first meeting is just to get the second meeting essentially and that's when you can dig deeper into if it's tech and bring in the technical co-founder co co or if it's go to market and bring in the commercial co-founder um, so within the process, I think everybody gets the airtime and specializes. But if you look at it from a relationship building kind of thing, I think the most coherent way to begin to build that relationship is strongly one-on-one, -on -one, um, where you'll also get to tell the story in a more coherent way because it's coming from one person than two people, even if they're very well in sync, you know, can be a little bit incoherent when questions start getting fired back and forth as well. But does that mean that the first the first meeting with the VC is with one VC partner, or more likely a junior associate who will screen and and we say in the U.S. block and tackle? I, I would say it's rare that somebody meets you first. Uh, that's not so much the case. We well, take, not so much at your firm. I would say yeah, about the industry. In I general. think uh, as a whole, yeah, I think often there's a kind of junior to then in the first meeting to see it. We as uh, all of the partners in, in our firm take a lot of the first meetings because I think to be, it's, I mean, it has become, maybe it switches a little bit more, but kind of a seller's market, so to say. So, I mean, you have to be very forward leaning as, as an investor as well. And it's uh, particularly in the, the companies that you're most interested in investing in, it is as much a, a sell of the investor as, as the company. So um, we'll normally, or we'll very often be partners in the first meeting. So would a founder meet you and, and Luca in the same meeting or you would divide and conquer? No, we'll probably come later into the process. Okay. Um, so we'll probably later into the process then have meetings where multiple partners are part of it. I see. Would it differ for you, Rebecca? No, it's fairly similar, but I think both our associates and the rest of the team take first meetings. So we divide it quite equ equally. Um, but yeah. Do you think founders are sometimes misinformed about the access they're getting they they book a meeting and the, and the person they're meeting is 25 and and does hundreds of meetings a month and is checking boxes yeah i'm hoping it's i'm being a little critical yeah, of the, of the hoping process it shouldn't here matter. Uh, do you um, think it does in practice no uh, I, I hope not i don't think at our firm it matters uh, 
I think to your point, misinformed, I think it's an expectations management kind of question. So I think if that is the first meeting that you get, then there's nothing wrong with that. But it's, again, being aware of what the process probably looks like on the investor side. So on the back of that meeting with somebody more junior, you need to know that if you're if the process is going to go further, you're going to need to meet somebody more senior in the team at some point. So that's if you think about each step as just something to convert then if you've met a junior, then the conversion that you need is to then meet a senior person in the team. And, and, and that's fine. But then you, that's what you need to be thinking. <laughs> of course not. You should never do that. We have three senior people on the dais here, so you all have access to them immediately. <laughs> no, no, it seems it like was, you're itching to say something. As you yeah, think. I mean, I, I still have uh, a lot of uh, my my founder or entrepreneur uh, lens on me so i don't ever lose that you know i i oh it's impossible to do that in this industry but uh i would say um whoever you're meeting um don't be afraid to ask what do you need to know like what are you here to find out particularly if it's a junior because i was super annoyed meeting all these juniors and they were asking questions that had very little to do with my business model or the traction they were and checking they, boxes they were checking boxes all the time and i never met any of those boxes so i literally started to come into meetings and say what do you need to know and then quickly they kind of said, okay, five question. minutes. Yeah, after five minutes, they got what they needed to answer. And then I could make that phone call later on and said, what did the more senior person have to say? And you to might know have saved if I made it through. 25 minutes. Yeah, literally, both, both of us. And I think, I mean, they should appreciate it. I appreciate it uh, immensely. Um, but, and, and always, I mean, one of the questions I also did was, <laughs> even though they were juniors, was to ask how much experience do you have from building companies? Because that's also told me a lot. And what answer did you typically get? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of built my confidence <laughs> to be in this space now, knowing how few that actually built companies. Well, Emmett and Rebecca have both built companies. So we like to say founder first. So. And I think that's important. I will just stick up for the non-founder <laughs> investors out there that I think there is a... I have not built a company. There is a way. strong skill set in investing and not all founders, operators also convert to be good investors either because it's it's a very different type of work to do. It's a very different mindset to have. And you might also have a lot of experience from company building and within a given business model or sector that doesn't translate so much. So it also depends on the person. You can't take every lesson that you had from your journey and apply it to other people. So those that have seen a lot of journeys also have a value in, in what they bring to the table as well. So I think firms that have a mix of um, founders, operators, and people that have spent a lot of time investing and working with companies, I think that's the mix that you want to find. Sometimes worked with uh, founder VCs, and they always relate to this one company they work with. It's like it's not actually the same here, guys. It's uh, something else here. So it can, I think, sometimes be you know it, both sides goes. Um, but I, mean, I think. When we talk about hmm. you know Spotify, hmm. we still talk about Spotify. I have the deepest thoughts. Yeah, but I mean, when we talk with some investors, sometimes and they always bring out the Spotify card, and I'm obviously it's an incredible company. Congratulations! But it was built 15 years ago. Or the Klarna card. Or the Klarna card. Klarna card. Mm -mm. So, I mean, the, the, come on. That's a little bit of frustration. I think one of the weaknesses of the Swedish ecosystem is we're still talking about Spotify and Klarna. Thank you. Thank you. Who in the audience is the next Spotify and Klarna? Who in exactly. your portfolio? And how long are we going exactly. to talk about Spotify and Klarna? Thank you for saying that. Um, You're welcome. <laughs> I've said it before. <laughs> I guess the problem with Spotify and Klarna is that they, at one point, were the two biggest companies in Europe. So it's that they're so successful that they kind of get talked about more than they would be. But I agree. Well, Klarna better get their IPO off soon, or else it's going to be it's going to be a big down round. Yeah, that's one of my companies. <laughs> Please the previous take Still it away. An investor. It's a huge success story. Yeah, it's a huge success, and it's the only company that got listed last year that didn't lose their. Um, they're actually doing better than the and the first uh, immigrant should, founder yeah. IPO. Yeah, yeah. Well, we I do a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Rebecca can claim Excellent credit for company. it. <laughs> yeah, no. What I was and you have say, Trust Trace as well, which is yeah, Trust Trace. Um, yeah, racing a B round probably later this year. Excellent company. Yeah. 
Uh, no, what I was going to say is another thing to remember to do is do your due diligence and work who to contact on the investment firm, who actually has spent time in your you know, um, market or knows your business model and has experience for it because it can really help you if you get, you know, less dumb questions in a first meeting. And then once you meet a uh, investor and you move further in the investment process, also take references on that investor because that person is, you might end up working with um, her, him or her for like five to 10 years, right? On your board, asking either good or bad questions, right? So do take references. Um, talk to founders or work with before and make sure they're good. That's great advice, Rebecca. Who has another question? Front row. You were the first to arrive, Gustav. Thank you. Um, I'm Gustav. I'm a Microsoft for Startups uh, called Payish. Have you shared expenses with your friends? Yes. OK, because we make an interactive cart for people to share costs instantly in the cart. So. Now, when we're looking for VCs, we are aiming for several, but um, we finally settled with a few to have the first meeting and they want to meet in person. Is that common or do we usually take online meetings these days? That's a very topical question as Sweden gets back to normal, whatever normal was in Sweden. Do we want to get back to normal? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, just real quick, it depends on, on on your bandwidth, I would say. I mean, obviously, in-person meeting is always a great idea, just because then you kind of ask questions you didn't even thought of. It becomes more personal, obviously. But then it's just about the bandwidth as well. Yeah, I agree. I think it's dependent on if, you're, if schedules align, if you're in the same city, if you want it to be online or offline. Um, but we prefer to meet people in person as early as we can in the process because, yeah, as you said, I mean, it's you might work very closely with each other. So that's as much as important as anything to begin to get on with each other. I was just hired completely virtually. Mm. I think. Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> Once people get to know me, they drop out yeah, instantly. I think we quite often do first meetings uh, digitally and then try to move to physical meetings for the second meeting, mm. just for, I guess, efficiency purposes. But yeah, I do like meeting in person. It's so much nicer. Uh, we have a question in the second row here. Could you state your name, please? And I'm Sajan Pavlic, and I'm founder of uh, Capilite. So this might be more of an open-ended, maybe somewhat philosophical question to the panelists. Um, we touched on the overall decline in the market and there seems to be a volatility and whatnot, an increase in volatility. And so I uh, can't quite remember which one of you said this, but uh, something interesting was capital efficiency might become more important than sheer growth for companies. So not only might uh, founders struggle more to actually secure capital, but once they do, now that the environment is changing um, what are some of the key not only metrics but maybe also values that you might think is important for companies going forward to become and be more capital efficient and resilient in this type of environment would you be able to share some thoughts that Thank is you. a fantastic question and i would preface it by saying if anybody remembers the sequoia rip good times slide deck from 2008 and andreessen harwitz i don't know how public this is, but Andreessen Horowitz, at least we saw it, just published something internally for their portfolio companies. And I have it here. It's called Everything CEOs Know is Instantly Upside Down. And I'm happy to read some of the Andreessen Horowitz advice to their portfolio companies after we hear from our audience here in Stockholm. I want to hear that too. I haven't heard of it. Uh, but I think uh, one thing that we do in conversation with later stage companies because we don't invest in later stage companies but the funny thing later stage uh, founders want us on the cap table for what we represent and what we can bring on board um so the conversation has always been you know know your market i think now more than ever you have to be even better and faster in understanding what the next market is and how fast you can scale right and that's also um in terms of um how fast you can scale i think how much do you know about your own business versus new markets and why do you need to 
to go to those markets and win. I think, you know, having an answered that one is going to make it even easier for you to have those conversations now. Although you're not fundraising, you know, you're fundraising for what, what stage you're at, preparing for the next, have those conversations now um, and as soon as possible. That's the, the feedback I'm getting, but I don't invest in that late. I think it has changed now. It is becoming more important for VCs to see that you can grow in a more efficient manner. Before, it was almost okay to grow and then burn a lot of cash or burn sometimes more cash than you were actually transforming into revenue. And I think those days are over. Uh, we want to see that if you're spending a dollar, you're actually turning that into at least a dollar of revenue, hopefully even better. Uh, Emma, and resilience is very important, for sure. Yeah. Emma, do you have any thoughts, or shall I quote Sequoia and Andreessen Horowitz? I'm sure that's very wise. So, <laughs> quote, quote away. Well, I printed. I printed it off the internet. <laughs> All right. So, so this is 2008, which uh, it seems like yesterday to me, anyway. That Lehman went under. Sure. So, Sequoia is one of the biggest and most successful venture funds in the United States as is Andreessen Horowitz. Um, Andreessen Horowitz, I would say, has come up in the last 15 years. Sequoia has a 35 or 40 year history. So in 2008, when when Lehman Brothers went under, my brother worked there. Uh, so it was a big hit to our family. Uh, Sequoia published a PDF slide deck, which you can Google, RIP Good Times. It's They still have it on their website. The good times are over. And I printed some pages here, the new realities, and this may sound very prescient or may sound very familiar. The $15 million raise at $100 million post is gone. Series B and C will be smaller raises. Customer uptake will be slower. Cuts are a must, need to become cash flow positive. That's the first slide that's non-economic macro. Increased challenges, M&As will decrease, prices will decrease. Acquiring entities will favor profitable companies. IPOs will continue to decrease and will take longer. I have a little Schematic here, preserve capital versus grab market share, very much on the preserve capital. Check must have product, check establish revenue model, check understanding of market uptake, check customers' abilities to pay, check assessment versus competitors, check cash is king, check need for profitability. Ops review, engineering, decrease headcount for next version. Product, what features are absolutely essential. Marketing, measuring, cutting what's not working. Sales and business development, getting return on expense increase. Pipeline, real probabilities of closing deals. Finance, cash burn. Where can payments be def deferred? GNA, what departments are essential? And then their solution page, the last slide in the deck. Solution, perform situation analysis. Adapt quickly, use a zero-based ZBB budgeting approach. Make cuts, review salaries, employ a heavily commissioned sales structure, bolster balance sheet, become cash flow positive as soon as possible. And I love this one, spend every dollar as if it were your last. That was the advice from 2008. And the Andreessen Harwitz thing that just got circulated, at least in our inboxes, was everything CEOs know is instantly upside down. Raising money is easy, was before. Now it's raising money is impossible. Growth is the most important thing, has become survival is the only thing. Listen to your team. And I'm going to curse here because I'm reading. Your team doesn't know shit and far less than you do. War for talent, layoffs could be in our future. Real estate costs are what they are, don't time the market. Under no circumstances should you make a real estate commitment. That's the new reality. 18 months of cash is a lot, has become two years of cash may not be enough. Minimize dilution has become maximize cash. Raise and grow to take market share has become stay alive to take market share. Debt is cheap has become debt is expensive. Good management is retaining your people has become more time. And then the fallacies here, I can always get to cash flow positive and cut burn. Yes, but the company will end up in a zombie state with no growth and no bids for the next round. We'll grow and improve efficiency at the same time. Inefficient growth is empty calories that you won't get credit for. And finally, I can always fall back on debt has become lenders of the business of never losing money. And they will simply not wire if they see this as a risk, typically when you have less than 12 months of cash. So this is what Andreessen Horowitz has just emailed their portfolio companies. Um, it was in a public forum, so I don't think I'll get in trouble for sharing that since it, it has made the rounds of the internet. But to me, that struck me eerily like 2008. I don't know where we are, but I know that Spotify Spotify broke $100 today on their stock price, and it was 365 
um, in February of 2021. Yes. Do you guys what do you advise your founders at the moment? Because on the one hand, you want them to raise as much cash as possible, right? So they can endure for a long time. But at the same time, you don't want them to bloat their valuation too early because yeah. it will become a lot harder to raise the next round. And I struggle a little bit there because at the same time, you want to be mindful so they maybe have up to 24 uh, months burn, but not uh, too early take on too high a valuation that might end up biting them in yeah, later down. What do you think about that? I'm glad you asked the question, Rebecca, because it was in my list of questions, but I wanted to, to come out organically from our chat. I mean, I think it's a it's an interesting point and it's a difficult balance to strike. I think so far in our portfolio, those that have been raising and closing in the first half of this year have raised similar to what we might have expected before. Um, Obviously, not all of the companies in our portfolio that raise now in the next months will, will necessarily have that kind of luxury and, and will need to be a little bit more thoughtful whether to yeah, really raise for longer runway or raise to, you know, think about because you always need to take into account what is the fundraising journey or what, what is the equity story that you want to create. It's not only this round now, but it's what is the next round and the valuation then and when might that be in time. Um, but I think we will much more be advising companies to take money that's on the table because we don't know if there's going to be less of it on the table in the future and to probably plan for a growth trajectory in the next phase that is less aggressive than perhaps they would have set off on um, some months ago so that the plan for runway is a little bit longer than it might have been. But at the same time, you know, I think we we still want to do risk capital so um if we see there's an opportunity to lean into to you know a trajectory then then we will encourage that and i think uh you know that's that's part of it too um we're fortunate enough to meet incredible founders that are already done the homework in terms of bootstrap they've been bootstrapping for years um so we know when you know when we invest in them that the, the capital is just the last, last part of the puzzle of their um, journey. It, it doesn't start with the capital. So I think what we're seeing right now in the conversations that we're having is that many of them have incredible revenue. So right now we're just looking at, you know, where does that take them? But what we're seeing more and more for our type of founders is that we're seeing more these uh, bridge rounds happening more and more. And they're raising bridges on safe wise. Um, as well. So, and that's a little bit, I don't know how I feel about that. I don't know what the conversation you have, but I mean, I'm, I'm fearing that we're going to see much more of these much frequently instead of a, um, a full equity round. I agree. I agree. Who's got another question? Please state your name. And... Uh, well, my name is Grace and Hi, Grace. Uh, I'm a, a founder of uh, Harvard Agency. We're a media startup agency. We acquire IPs for film, TV, gaming, and NFT and Web3 platforms. But um, just going back to touching on what you had mentioned and also going back to recent conversation now, just two things, leadership and also customer value. And, uh, you know, where we're going, really, we, have, we can have all the best ideas, right, and definitely, you know, the possibility for, you know, startup and scale-ups, et cetera. But... I think anyway that one of the conversations that I think we're missing is really the lens of who who are we who are we here for right what is our business for and who is it for and that really also sort of segues into leadership and and the brand value of a startup company and and what that means I mean capital is important but also the brand value is the capital of you know, what founders are going to do and how are they going to do that and how to retain that so that it grows. And one of my arguments is, is that, you know, fantastic Spotify, fantastic Klarna as, you know, yesterday's amazing success stories. But in terms of how do you retain that brand value, that, you know, that in my view, that perspective is really up to the customer and how the customer sees this brand value and, you know, the, the journey, right? And uh, we talked about equity story, the journey of that equity story and how that, you know, connects to, 
uh, a, com a community and culture and, you know, what is the need? What is the need? And just quickly touching on NFTs and Web3, I'm dealing, you know, one of my business is NFTs and we're looking at IPs to democratize NFTs. And one of the um, gaps that has happened over the years is, in fact, has been closed as a result of social media for marginal groups that, you know, we, I mean, we haven't been able to, we didn't know about things or didn't really hear about opinions until social media came along and suddenly, you know, groups and people and individuals had a platform and this has become such an important tool moving forward and has created such incredible communities. And NFTs, in both from a financing structure as well as a community platform, certainly has this power. And yes, I heard hype and, you know, the story hasn't been written yet. Uh, and, it, you know, it is a valuable platform going forward in terms of what is next, you know, who is going to be next and how is that next going to be next? We actually just invested in the community platform, so even though there's hype, uh, I agree, there's definitely uh, opportunity as well. Grace, was there a question that you'd like to have the audience? I'll restate for the webcast. Grace asked a question about how our panelists evaluate leadership when they uh, when they invest in, in in early stage founders. Yeah, that's a really good question, uh, and I think we always look for founders to be very sort of self aware and be aware of what they need to strengthen around themselves to become even stronger as a team uh, moving forward. That's something I really really like, and being very visionary and clear of what they want to build uh, and be able to engage and create uh, excitement both towards us and towards their team on that mission um, that's something i really like and being values driven and being true to what that they actually care about the problem they want to solve that that's genuine uh, you genuinely have experienced or know this problem really really well um yeah yeah, well, I would just add to that that obviously it's very difficult at the point of investing, particularly very early on when a company might just be a few people to, you know, really understand quality of leadership there. So I think it's something that we look at over time, you know, once we've invested, because leadership obviously isn't the values that you say that you have. It's, I mean, it's the actions and it's the way that you work. So, you know, we look at how our founders and the the management teams that evolve as the company grows as it goes into different phases faced with different challenges and it's not always going to be the people that were the most senior in their different roles in the beginning that are going to be the most senior in those roles two years out four years out however many years out um and that's again to self-awareness something that i think some founders can recognize as it's happening themselves others you know can be helped to to recognize that um but for sure it's leadership changes as the company takes many different shapes and forms from as early as i think the three of us invest um i would add values i think leadership at early stages is really hard to define but i think values are much much easier and i think if you build a company culture based on values that is going to create the leadership that is needed to keep on you know um building what whatever that might be that you're building so i think being focused on value at early stages to redefine or define leadership with it i love what nora just said because i think especially in sweden with a consensus driven management style that operates um, which can be anth antithetical to 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 growth in a startup context the values are really important i would also argue that leadership mutates over time and if you look at Spotify, I think there was a distinct lack of leadership in Spotify's reaction to the Joe Rogan yeah. controversy. And I think um, without touching the third rail of Swedish startups, although I am getting awfully close, mm -hmm. I think one can examine the leadership at Klarna yeah. and, and, and a, a assess the business model and assess leadership there. And of course, two of the principal founders of Klarna have, have, have left and a leadership may reside in one person um, at a certain point, and that can send the company in a direction that maybe was not intended at the stage at which uh, which you invest. 
And just from a personal perspective, I mean, I get a lot of conversations where some might think that the, the voice that I do have is a little bit of a leadership in, in a subject that and I say to everyone is that I've, I've never had a leadership role in that sense. It's just that my voice was amplified by the silence in that industry that I happen to end up in. So um, so I think leadership at the end of the day is, as, as we've mentioned over again, is value. And, and I hope and wish that we all uh, align ourselves with leaders with the right values that, that increases our chances of ending up in a, in a great culture at the end of the day. Who's got another question? Are we ready to wrap? Sure. Could you pass it back, please? Uh, what's the role of the prototype for in in a in a pitch for you to uh, to make a decision? The question was, what is the role of the prototype in in a, a pitch context? Um, it, it, it's if it's existing or if uh, if it's yeah, well, we go in at very early stages, so sometimes the, there isn't any prototype, uh, but obviously it helps immensely if there's a prototype. Um, I myself love to test and try everything if there's a prototype, so obviously that helps me a lot to understand it better. Um, but we're at stages that we need to understand that you're able to build it the way that you're presenting it. I think that's the case in very early stages. Maybe even more important sort of early feedback from alpha testers and customers you've talked to, because I'm probably not going to be an expert uh, on your product and the product you're building. You probably know that even better than me, right? So then it's more important for me to hear that you get a lot of sort of early feedback from potential users and customers and have been iterating with them to build something that's very relevant for them. Um, yeah. Please, Nora. I mean, if, if you, I mean, like Rebecca mentioned, I think one of the biggest things that sometimes uh, get lost in, trans in translation um, is not just, you know, the KPIs of we have this many users and this many uh, from a macro perspective is that I want to understand why they love it, right? Mm -hmm. What is keeping them coming back over and over again? And that's sometimes not even, you know, the, the testing is not done properly because they still don't have an answer for that question when I ask them. But, but what is it that keeps them coming back? We're approaching the 90 minute mark and, and I've seen almost everybody off their phones. I wanna be respectful of our panelists time. I think some may stay for, for a little bit of mingling, but um, everybody is free to leave. And I think Nora in particular needs to leave. Um, on the early side. So unless there's another question, I'd like to to bring this to a close with uh, a round of applause for Rebecca Broad and Venture, Emmett King at J12, and Nora Bavy at Unconventional Ventures, and not least, Erica Martini uh, in the back, who's running the, the AV and soundboard. And, and to each and every one of you as founders and as people who are interested in the startup ecosystem for coming out on a beautiful day in Stockholm, when I think we all would have rather have been outside. <laughs> and um, for supporting me and Techstars in, in us getting off the ground here. We start up ecosystems and we could not exist without you. So thanks to all of you for your time, your attention and your talent and hope to see you again at more forums like this. So a round of applause for our panelists, please. I think we can Thank cut you. off the webcast now, Erica.